Now, welcome to part 9 of my story that will, in a way, both carry on the Star Wars sequel trilogy or continue the journey of some of its characters, while also sort of rewriting or undoing the story of the sequels at the same time. Or as I like to put it, this is a story of how what comes next will change what came before. And if you're new to the story or haven't seen the first several parts yet, I would highly, highly recommend starting at part 1, and if you enjoy it, working your way back to this one. Otherwise, what is going on right now in the story will make no sense to you whatsoever. And a link to the playlist can be found in the description below. And so now, without further ado, let's get back to the story. We begin in a dimly lit cantina, filled with patrons of all types and from all corners of the galaxy, most of which are quietly talking amongst themselves, all the while nonchalantly keeping tabs on everything and everyone around them, this apparently being the type of place where almost anything can happen at any time. In one of the shadowy corners of this cantina, seated around a small circular table and talking quietly or just loud enough to hear each other over a strange electronic sounding music that's playing, are Finn, Poe, and Mara Jade, different colored drinks set down before them that haven't been touched. And as we listen in, we hear Mara say her eyes focused on Poe. This friend of yours is coming, right? Poe gives her a reassuring nod of the head and says back, He'll be here, don't worry. He never misses the opportunity for a payday, especially one this big. Mara makes a face as if people like that are her least favorite type in the galaxy, those who only care about money. She then says, And how do we know this information will be good? Skywalker is a very difficult target for even the best to track down. Trust me on that one. Poe then says back, Believe me, my friend will be able to tell us where he is. He'll get that information. Mara, looking nothing but skeptical, then says, If only Ahsoka had been more used to us, we wouldn't even have to be here now. Finn then speaks up and says, She said she couldn't help us, not while the darkness of that place was still lingering around in her mind, but she said she'd be back after she dealt with it, after she found Ezra, who was the only one who could help her, and that she was the only one who could help him, whatever that all means. Finn then finishes with a big, exaggerated shrug and picks up his bright blue drink and takes a small sip. Mara then asks him, And what exactly did you tell her about what we were doing, who we were looking for? Finn sets his drink down and says, Nothing, or almost nothing. She didn't want to know any of it. She didn't trust herself. Just kept saying she had to get her mind right first, that she had to get someone called Morai back, and that Ezra was the only one who could help her with all that. Mara then sighs and shakes her head a bit before saying, If anyone could have helped us track down Luke Skywalker, it would have been his father's former apprentice. Instead, we've wasted how long now chasing leads that led nowhere? Poe then chimes in, Too long. That's why it was time to go to my friend, despite the price tag. Mara shoots back, If he's your friend, shouldn't you be getting a discount or something? Poe frowns and grumbles back, I am. Finn then leans forward, looking at Poe, and asks, What did you say his name was again? It's at that moment, much to the surprise of all three, that someone sits down at the table, offers them all a broad smile, and says, His friend's name is Dash, Dash Rendar, and he's getting quite a discount from me considering what he's asking for. At this, Poe smiles from ear to ear and says, Good to see you again, old buddy, as he extends a hand across the table that Dash takes while saying, Good to see you too, in return. Mara, however, only stares at Dash with cold, unimpressed eyes before saying, You are going to tell us where to find Luke Skywalker. Dash gives her a brief look over before smiling at her and saying, Yeah, I am. If you've got the credits, and if I feel comfortable telling you where my friend is. Your friend? Please. You look like the last person someone like Luke Skywalker would call friend. Dash, still smiling, leans back in his chair and says, then you clearly don't know much about Luke Skywalker or the company he keeps. Me and Luke go way back, and I also go way back with those who know what he's up to these days. Mara looks more skeptical than ever, but Poe says to her, he's telling the truth, he worked with the Rebellion during the war. Mara quickly responds back, worked with or for the Rebellion for a price. Dash grins again, even lets out a small chuckle. You'll like me more once you get to know me, trust me. I highly doubt either of those things will happen. Finn then puts a hand on Mara's arm and says, Let's at least hear him out. We have to find Luke somehow. Dash then turns his attention to Finn and says, And why exactly is that? His eyes then turn towards Mara and he finishes, Why exactly are you looking for my friend? Before Mara can say anything to that, Finn leans closer to Dash and says, 
I need his help. I need to be trained. I also think, but before Finn can say any more, Poe places a hand on his arm and speaks up and says, You have to trust me on this one, buddy. We're looking for him for all the right reasons. Dash, his eyes on Finn, says, Training, huh? He shakes his head a bit, looks at Poe and makes a gesturing motion with his hand, at which point Poe puts a small leather pouch on the table and slides it towards Dash, who picks it up and says, It's all in there, right? Poe only stares back blankly, and Dash, who nods and tucks the pouch away in his pocket, says, He's on a planet called Volric, checking out the remains of a Jedi temple there. Poe thinks a moment, shakes his head and says, Never heard of it. Dash grins and replies, No one has, that's why the temple's still there. Why it avoided the Imperial Purge of all things Jedi. Also didn't hurt that it was buried under a mountain of snow, apparently. That only every hundred years or so, the planet's at a point in its orbit that it melts enough to reveal this temple. Poe gives him a keen look and says, The name of a planet no one's ever heard of does us little good, old friend. Dash shrugs and says, Well, then it's a good thing I know where it is. But... Poe cuts him off and says, You better not be about to say, But it'll cost us extra. Dash chuckles, Though that isn't a terrible idea. What I was actually about to say is, You have to promise me that this is for the right reasons, Poe. Dash again glances at Mara and finishes, Luke is my friend after all, and the last thing I want is to send trouble his way. Poe quickly replies, You have my word. Dash takes one last long look at Mara before looking at Poe, looking him in the eyes and finally nodding and saying, All right, all right. I'll give you the location of the planet then. That's when we're taken across the galaxy, and we see an Imperial Star Destroyer in orbit high above a dreary gray world. We're then taken inside the ship into a medium-sized circular room where the walls are lined with shelves holding artifacts of all types from across the galaxy, and where Grand Admiral Thrawn sits behind a desk, his eyes on a small holographic image of Moff Gideon, and to it we hear Thrawn say, I must say that I'm a bit confused and disappointed. Your last report said you had the child and this Mandalorian and his comrades trapped, that they had no way to escape, and yet now you tell me they've done just that. Gideon responds, Many apologies, Grand Admiral, but the child has proven a far more elusive prey than anticipated, especially while being aided by this Mandalorian. The doors to Thrawn's office then slide open, and in walks a female Imperial officer, a commander to be exact, and when she sees that Thrawn is busy, she simply stands at attention just inside the door and waits. Thrawn glances at her, then back down at the holographic image of Gideon, and says, If I was not preoccupied elsewhere, I would handle this myself. But I have to trust that your recent incompetence is a mere aberration, and that you will finally capture this child. All Gideon says in response is, It shall be done, Grand Admiral. Thrawn then hits a button on his desk, and the image of Gideon fades away. He then focuses on the commander and says, Something troubles you, Commander. The commander walks forward a few steps and stops before Thrawn's desk and says, Never before have I ever really questioned any of your decisions or orders, Grand Admiral, especially your recent one to promote me. And on the rare times I had any doubt at all with the course of action you decided upon, I've always been proven wrong in the end. Thrawn looks calmly at her, his expression perhaps a touch impressed and intrigued. He then gives her a nod of the head as if to tell her to keep speaking, and so the commander continues. Myself and some of the crew are wondering, sir, what exactly are we still doing here? It's been weeks. we found nothing. No trace of evidence that Ezra Bridger survived, and no signs of anything else going on here other than these strange creatures, some of which we've captured and analyzed, and they're just beasts, sir. Odd, but nothing special. Thrawn then asks, And what is odd about them, Commander? She thinks a moment, then says, Well, they're unusually large size, for one, especially considering the entire surface of the planet is barren. We don't even know what they eat. Thrawn then says, And yet they do indeed grow to tremendous size, which means... The Commander begins to nod, seeing Thrawn's point. Which means they must have a food source somewhere, and a rather plentiful one at that, which means we are missing something. But what is it, sir? Thrawn leans back in his chair and says, I spent a good deal of time on this planet pondering that very question, Commander. 
what is special about this world? Always asking myself, what was I missing? Why would the Pergil bring us here? Until I realized they hadn't brought us, they had only brought Ezra Bridger, that I was never meant to see this place, that it was Ezra's compassion that saved my life, not the Pergil and their purpose. And as I would see in my time with Bridger, it was that same compassion that allowed him to befriend the creatures of this world. The commander nods her head and says, So you think Bridger is in the same place that these creatures get their food? Thrawn gives a single nod of the head and says, Precisely. The commander then asks, And how do we find him? Or how do we lure him out? Thrawn gives a tight-lipped smile and says, It's quite simple. We use Bridger's compassion against him. The commander cocks her head in a way that says she would love to know how to do that, and Thrawn responds, Launch all TIE Fighters. Tell them they are to shoot down and kill any and all creatures they see. Perhaps that will get Bridger's attention. There's an ever so slight smile or smirk on the commander's face as she nods her head and says, Very good, Admiral. I shall see it carried out. She then starts to turn as if she's about to go, till she stops and says, and the prisoner, sir, what about her? Thrawn gives her a look as if to ask what she's even referring to, and so the commander says, Your tactics with her seem unusually cruel, for you at least. I've never known you to employ such extreme methods before. Thrawn replies, She is far, far more dangerous than she appears, commander. The commander nods as if she understands, and then waits for Thrawn to explain further, as he all too often does. But this time, however... Thrawn says no more, and after a somewhat awkward moment of silence, she simply says, Very good then, Admiral, before leaving the room. That's when we're taken elsewhere in the Star Destroyer, into a small dark cell where, with her hands chained to the wall which keeps her standing upright, we see Rey, eyes barely open, looking like an utterly exhausted, skinnier and weaker version of her former self. And just as her eyes slide shut and her body goes slack as she falls asleep, a loud, ear-piercing siren sounds, and she's jarred back awake. After only a few seconds, her eyes begin to close yet again, but once more, the siren sounds, and they instantly shoot back open. But this time, when they do, she's stunned to see, standing before her, the soft blue image of Ben Solo. Immediately, tears begin to well up in her eyes, and she opens her mouth to say something, but her throat is so dry and sore that only a hoarse whisper comes out. Ben, is that really you? Ben smiles at her for a moment and then says, it is, or at least it's the part of me that will always be with you, always be a part of you. A tear slides down Ray's cheek as she manages to say, Palpatine, he's a part of me too. I know, Ben responds. Ray then says, I can't fight him. I can't take much more of this. You have to, Ben quickly says. Palpatine is laying dormant, allowing you and you alone to suffer through this, hoping it will break you once and for all, destroy the last remnants of you. And if that happens, there will be no more you. It'll only be him, forever. More tears stream down Ray's face as she says, You have to help me, please. But Ben shakes his head and says, There's nothing I can do, not against his power. Ray shakes her head as if she will not or cannot accept that answer. Please, Ben, please. I can't take much more of this. And with those words, Ray's eyes again slide shut, but this time the siren doesn't blare and she's allowed to sleep, at least for a time. The soft blue image of Ben Solo remains for a few moments longer, first looking upon Ray with nothing but sorrow, concern, and compassion, but then his eyes turn from her and his look becomes distant, as if he's seeing something else entirely, something far, far away, something across time and space perhaps. Which is when we too are taken elsewhere, to somewhere a great distance away, where we see Luke Skywalker walking amongst the ruins of what appears to be an ancient Jedi temple, set on a cold, mountainous, and mostly snow-covered world, though currently the sun seems to be large and high in the sky, melting much of the snow below. And so as Luke walks through the temple, rather sizable puddles are pooling up as water streams down from the ceiling and through multiple cracks in the otherwise smooth, eroded walls. In fact, the sound of running and splashing water is so loud and echoes so much through the stone halls that Luke jumps a bit when R2 rolls up behind him and lets out a series of beeps and whistles to get his attention. 
Luke then whirls around to give the little droid a brief, stern look before turning back to a wall and running his hand over the nearly perfectly smooth surface, other than the slightest hint that, once upon a time at least, there may have been something, some sort of lettering or inscriptions perhaps, etched into the stone. Luke, trying not to look frustrated but failing, moves forward down the hall and into a large, perfectly square room with a massive crack in the ceiling that lets the bright rays of the sun shine through, and this room is lined with stone shelving that contains books, thousands upon thousands, if not tens of thousands, of leather-bound books. But each and every one Luke picks up and examines is waterlogged and covered in colorful mold, and the pages within are either disintegrated, or the ink that once covered those pages has long since been washed away, or is smudged to the point that it's impossible to make anything from it. After some time of this, of picking up and quickly discarding useless books, Luke shakes his head and looks at R2 and says, Why would the Jedi build a temple here, in a place that spends hundreds of years at a time buried under snow, and only a short amount of time uncovered? R2 lets out a series of beeps and whistles. Afterwards, Luke, with a skeptical look on his face, responds, That's what the data suggests? That the orbit of the planet changed thousands of years ago? But what could do that? R2 lets out another series of beeps and whistles that makes it sound like he's saying, your guess is as good as mine. Luke then picks up another book, opens it, and sees nothing but soaked blank pages and quickly tosses it back on the shelf as the frustration on his face continues to mount. A moment later, he winces in pain and puts his hand to his head. R2 quickly puts together an inquisitive and worried series of beeps and Luke says to him, it's nothing for you to worry about, buddy. It's just this feeling, a feeling I keep getting lately. Luke shakes his head as if he doesn't know how else to describe it. He then tries to pretend he's fine and picks up another book, but before even opening it, he says, What am I even doing here, R2? What am I hoping to accomplish? Maybe, maybe I'm just meant to be alone, to never figure any of this Jedi stuff out. Maybe Yoda was wrong, I'm not supposed to pass on what I've learned. Maybe the Jedi should... But before Luke finishes what he was about to say, he sees movement out of the corner of his eyes, a dark shadow of some kind. He then whispers to R2, Did you see that? But the droid's domed head swivels from side to side. Luke then asks, Picking anything up on your scanners, maybe? Again, the droid's domed head swivels from side to side, and this time there's a couple beeps and whistles that seem to ask, Are you sure you're okay? Luke says, I'm fine, and pats the droid on that domed head before quickly moving off in the direction he saw something move, and R2 quickly follows. He then again sees that movement, which is little more than a shadowy blur heading down a hallway that's connected to the large library he's currently in. Without hesitation, Luke follows and begins walking down a long, rather narrow corridor, at one point pulling out his lightsaber and igniting it, using the green blade for light. Soon after doing that, he looks over his shoulder and quietly asks R2, Was this tunnel here before? But the droid makes a response that sounds like him saying, I can't be expected to know everything. After some time, the narrow hallway comes to a steep, spiraling staircase leading down, which is when Luke yet again, moving swiftly down it, catches a glimpse of this strange shadow, and so he immediately starts heading down the steps after it. When he reaches the bottom of them, after going down a good hundred steps or so, he finds himself in a slightly wider corridor, the floor of which is covered in water that comes up just below his waist. The walls of this corridor, that he can see by the glow of his green lightsaber, are lined with stone statues that are so worn down and eroded that they are little more than vague humanoid shapes. Luke quickly begins to make his way down the corridor and through the waist-high water, at one point glancing behind and seeing that R2 is no longer following him. And when he looks ahead again, he sees, on the fringe of the light given off by his saber, the shadow. And this time, Luke calls out to it, calls out for it to wait, but the shadow is gone even before the echo of his voice fades away. Faster now, Luke makes his way through the water and down what's seeming to be an endless corridor, which is when several things happen almost all at once, starting with a loud, thunderous boom that violently shakes the entire temple, which actually turns out to be a massive stone slab sliding down from the ceiling and locking into place directly behind Luke, completely blocking his way back. In that same moment caused by the boom or the impact of the slab, multiple gaping cracks form in the walls and ceiling and large amounts of water begin to gush in, quickly beginning to fill the corridor. At that same moment, startled and jostled by the boom, 
Luke drops his lightsaber into the water and is briefly plunged into absolute darkness as it deactivates upon him losing his grip on it. But in the next instant, the corridor seems to be illuminated by its own unseen light source, and Luke is able to see, standing before him, a shadowy figure of what appears to be someone rather tall in black robes of some kind, and with a hood pulled up and mostly over a masked face, a black helmet with silver lines going horizontally across it that we know to be the helmet of Kylo Ren. Before Luke can even react in any way, the image of Kylo Ren reaches up and removes the helmet, and for the briefest of moments, the face Luke sees revealed behind it is of a young, maybe four or five-year-old Ben Solo, the age his nephew currently is. But in the very next instant, the face is that of a man, of Ben Solo, as he will be around the age of 30. Ben? Luke says, looking confused and skeptical at first, but then something inside of him, or from the Force perhaps, tells him that this is somehow his nephew, or what he will one day be or look like, and so Luke, nothing but smiling, quickly moves forward, saying his nephew's name with excitement. He even takes him by the shoulders, gives him a quick look over, and with pride in his eyes, he says, Ben, look at what you will become. Ben, however, says and does nothing. He stands as still and as lifeless as one of the statues lining the hall, but is nevertheless flesh and blood, or feels that way to Luke. And so, soon enough, Luke's joyous expression begins to slowly change as he again looks his nephew over, his eyes eventually going to and lingering on the strange helmet being held in his nephew's hand, a helmet that one second looks like the helmet of Kylo Ren, but in the next looks like the melted helmet of Darth Vader. Luke then takes a step back, all the joy on his face replaced by sadness and maybe some grief as he says, Ben, look at what you become. Luke then shuts his eyes and shakes his head as if he doesn't want to see any of this anymore, but when he again opens them, he sees Ben still standing there, unmoving. That's when Luke seems to remember the water, which is now higher than his waist and getting higher with each passing second. Luke then reaches his hand into the water and pulls his lightsaber to him and quickly moves to the stone slab blocking the way he originally came. Briefly, he tries to use the force to move it back up and into the ceiling, but it barely even budges an inch. He then ignites his lightsaber and takes a few quick hacks at the slab, but the saber seems to do little more than singe the dense stone, and so Luke deactivates it and turns back around and once again sees Ben just standing there motionless. However, behind him now, maybe 30 paces or so beyond Ben, Luke sees a set of stairs that wasn't there before, one leading up and out of the corridor that is rapidly filling with water. Luke then says as he slowly approaches Ben, we have to get out of here. But Ben still says and does nothing. Luke then goes right up to Ben, the water chest level now, and says as he looks into his eyes, Ben, we have to go. The way out is right behind you. Just turn around and you'll see it. Finally, Ben moves, and it's to shake his head before saying, you have to leave me. But Luke vehemently shakes his head and says, no, I I'd never abandon you. Never. But to that, Ben says, yes, you will, as he lifts his helmet that again looks like the helmet of Kylo Ren and puts it back on. And as soon as it is, Ben takes hold of his lightsaber and ignites it, the unstable looking red blade springing to life. Luke, his own lightsaber in hand, merely glances at it briefly before looking back at Ben, who says to him through the mask now, you can still save yourself. But Luke shakes his head and drops his saber into the water and says, not if I can't save you. Luke takes a few steps back, the water now up to his neck, and Ben says, that's not the choice you make. It's not your destiny to save me. It's your destiny to create me. Luke then says as the water reaches his chin, I'd rather die than fail you. To that, Kylo says, we'll see. As the water now reaches Luke's mouth and soon his nose, and all Luke does is stand there and close his eyes. Long moments go by until there is another loud, booming thud, or more like an explosion as the slab of stone breaks asunder and into several large chunks. And at the same time, a large cracks also form in the floor, and the corridor quickly begins to drain of water as it flows into an even lower chamber somewhere below. And now, standing on the opposite side of where the slab used to be, quickly picking themselves up after being knocked down by the sudden burst of water, is Finn, Mara Jade, Poe, and R2-D2. 
And we see that Mara is looking at Finn with disbelief on her face as he gives her a shrug in response as if to say he doesn't know what just happened or how, implying it was somehow him that dealt with the slab of stone blocking their way. That look of disbelief on Mara's face instantly vanishes though when she looks down the corridor at the way that's just been unveiled to them and sees a man that she can only assume is Luke Skywalker and he's on the ground looking up at, to her utter fear and amazement, a figure that looks just like Darth Sidious with a crimson red lightsaber in hand and raised above his head, ready to bring it down on Luke. But from Luke's perspective and oblivious to anything and anyone else around him, he sees his nephew raising a red saber over his head, saying the words, you did this to me, before he starts to bring it down upon Luke. But all Luke does is shut his eyes, refusing to strike back against his nephew in any way. And so Luke is then utterly and completely stunned to hear the sound of two sabers clashing, and when he opens his eyes, it's no longer his nephew or Kylo Ren standing over him, but instead Darth Sidious and that his strike was blocked by a woman with fiery red hair wielding a blue lightsaber. That same woman then makes an attack of her own, one that passes through the chest of Sidious, who in the same instant essentially vanishes, the only trace of him left behind being a cackling laugh that echoes for long moments before fading away completely. Luke then sees the red-haired woman extend one hand down to him, offering to help him up, while in the other, after deactivating it, he sees the lightsaber of his sister, Leia. And that is where this part ends. Well, that's all I've got for you this time. Now it's your turn to tell me what you thought of this part of the story and what you think might happen next. So leave a comment below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thank you for watching.